<laughs> I think what uh, we would like to do at this point, try perhaps what we did yesterday, try to collect some questions that uh, you might have after this uh, uh, intense day of uh, sets of conversations and try to see how we can engage ourselves in a conversation here in the, at the um, table. And if, if I could, just to remind us of some, of somehow of the earlier discussions as well, because otherwise there's always a tendency to, to, for the latest discussions to dominate. Um, and, I, and actually, I think there's an interesting um, relation uh, between uh, two of the sessions that looked at uh, the question of institutional critique and the one that looked with uh, Marianne and, and, and Kirsten and, uh, in, in terms of... Uh, um, uh, I, I suppose again sort of institution or, or the impossibility of uh, institution actually in the sense that you looked at. Um, I wanted to ask Helmut because we were talking about the question of um, artists changing this first, second, potential third generation of good artists that might return and save us all by being radical outsiders again or something like this. Um, and I was wondering whether was it not more a case that the artists didn't change in this whole period, but actually the institutions were the things that changed? The, 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 the pivotal change in institutional critique was not the position or the role or even the ideological assumptions of the artists, but the role and ideological assumptions of the institution. Would you, would you see that as one way of defining the change rather than this generational idea of artists passing the baton adequately or in, uh, inadequately from one to the other? Can I add to it? Sorry about that, but mm -hmm. what was browsing my mind similarly? If this is the case, how did this um, change artistic practice? <laughs> if this is the case. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I think uh, Christian already answered it, partially at least. Um, in addressing uh, the more the, the, the institutional change, but I think it's it's not so easy to uh, to uh, grasp what exactly changed within institutions uh, since not since '89, but since the, since curators came up in the late '60s, early '70s as a sort of you know lack or whatever within official museum representations. Um, that there was a chance for free curators to have a little bit, you know, an, a short advantage yeah, of information. It was some kind of knowledge production of being around in the art world and being able to, to use this kind of uh, information advantage. Yeah? And, and I think, of course, this has changed very much. Yeah? And for curators nowadays, I mean, it's such a, you know, hectic job to, uh, to be in advance in a certain way. I mean, um, for me, that's my, maybe a reason why I'm, I'm, I try not to work as a curator anymore because it's, you know, always traveling around. And so it's, uh, it's too, uh, in a way, uh, just, I mean, uh, I don't like it so much. <laughs> um, and it's too demanding in a certain way, this, this whole idea. Yeah? It's, it's, for me, it's very hard to imagine to, uh, to be a curator in, in, in this sense anymore. And that has to do with the, maybe not so much with the institution, but with the, with the, the process of differentiation yeah, is going on and on. Yeah? Uh, and so there are more subsystems, yeah? the biennial system, the manifesto system in the meantime, yeah? the, the political systems, uh, uh, autonomous groups, etc. They would also, uh, they, they also differentiate themselves from uh, from, from others, and that makes it so, so difficult. And I, I think uh, the problem is as long as we function within those, you know, more and more autonomous uh, spheres, yeah, and then, you know, it, I, I think it's the, 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 the big institutions we try to, to come clear, to cope with that situation, but it's much more with uh, the, the, the scenes themselves. Um, so that we have a, a like art market is always used here also as more or less the, the, the bad side yeah? in, a, in, in a certain sense. And of course it is in many ways, but it's not only. They also produce interesting art. They're also not all, you know, uh, morally cor 
uh, completely corrupted persons and things like that. Um, and I mean, I like painting and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but, you know, they constitute their own world in a certain way. Uh, and so for me, the main, the main purpose is how we can, can we still, you know, connect to the worlds. And that's so difficult, yeah? That's the big approach, extra disciplinary, as Brian Holmes or what, uh, 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 is naming it. But, uh, but how to do it uh, precisely? I mean, you're gaining some respectability, some privilege, and, and so in one field, yeah? But not in any other, of course, yeah? So that's why you're always trapped, more or less, you know? We all try, you know, to be interdisciplinary and to be serious politicians, uh, artists, and all at the same time. Uh, but, of course, you know, here we get invited. Here we get those speaking positions, not in the other field, yeah? Uh, and, and I think this, for me, is the, 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 main, the main difficulty. So it's not really the, the artists and the, and the institutions, but the change of, the, of the, 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 the emerging differentiation of, the, of subsystems of the art world, yeah? mm -hmm. uh, and subsystems also of other worlds which are, are connected. And that you, you, you know, in the academic world, you have the Lacanians, the Foucaultians, the Bouddhians, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And we all speak the same uh, the, in, in internally closed language system, yeah, which I consider really horrible. Yeah? It's really uh, unbelievable. Yeah? And everyone is an expert yeah, in that. Yeah? And everyone, you know, go to the Lacanians, you know, they, uh, uh, you have no chance, you know. I'm seminar 13, yeah, okay, and I'm seminar 20, yeah. I mean, it's really, you know, uh, really unbelievable. And I think we have to take that in, in, in mind and to reflect that also what we are doing, yeah, when we say, you know, this system is, you know, uh, outside, those are the, the painters, and we only make paintings for the, for the rich people and, and so on, uh, which is, of course, true, yeah, in many respects. <laughs> Sure, but there are, you know, interesting paintings as well, yeah? uh, uh, and, and I, think, um, I think it is important to precisely to distinguish that and to keep, you know, as, as far as it goes. I think the, the challenge for me is much more of a re reformism yeah? than the radical gesture. Yeah? Reformism, I think, is, you know, is so uh, denied and so, um, uh, but I think reformism is a real challenge, yeah? to be a reformist beyond, you know, beyond what everyday reformism is. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, Kirsten, I, I sense you'd go for a more radical option than the reformist, but maybe you could uh, also clarify. <laughs> um, and, and, also, and also a sense of, of um, I suppose it's a question, also in a sense, to clarify the, the polemics of this, this, uh, this, this, this interesting um, position on political art. Um, is, 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 is any kind of political agency possible to be formed within the institution, or does it have to be outside? Is, is the institution already always an impossibility for political agency in your critique, or is it the way the institutions have been used that you find to be problematic? I wonder if you could answer, maybe there's two questions there, but the radical versus reform and then the institution as a space of agency or potential space of agency. Can I borrow your you <laughs> um, First, um, I like painting too, um, just to start with. Um, I mean, the radical versus reformism is like the question of the political movement ever since the revolution yeah. sadly failed. Um, whatever revolution I mean with that now. But... Um, <laughs> All of them. Um, no, I would, I mean, um, um, I would definitely not opt for an exodus strategy. I would not say like exodus of uh, institutions. I wouldn't even say exodus of galleries. And um, I mean, in the, in the program it says like Kirsten Starkemeyer, curator Berlin. Actually, it's Kirsten Starkemeyer, gallery assistant Berlin. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm not a curator, never have been, never will be. Um, I hope. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that like there is one entity within the capitalist system which bears not any potential for change because I mean like to put it in an Adornian way like everything is um, the same way close to the center so everything also has the potential to be turned around and I wouldn't say like don't go into institutions or don't go into galleries but it is like about the what attitude is institutionalized within this specific entity which is the institution or the gallery which then is the question so every entity can be used as um, um, as like a starting point to betray it and the question is like how can you betray 
the, um, the general, hist like the um, hegemonic history of the gallery or the hegemonic history of the institution. And I would say that's right for different, uh, for different entities. So the question is how to become a traitor. So I would very much be with uh, what, uh, what David also said and um, to think about, it's very central to think about the historiography and to be, to solidarize with the past in a way. Because if you take, I mean, if you take the easiest example and look at what became of uh, Russian constructivism, and A, it was named Russian, Russian constructivism, which was a problem in the first place because that was a battle. Um, and then um, if you look at it now, it's like you have Rodchenko who's epitomized into a genius and you have different people who are epitomized into genius, but that was never the idea in the first place because they were collectively working and they didn't want to do great art but work on a different way of artistic production and history has made them geniuses, which is totally reactionary way to look at it. So it's, I think um, to have a present, like a radical present, very much depends on re-historiographizing, if that word exists, um, the past and to look at different ways in which um, history can be rewritten and that's very true for institutional critique uh, in many ways I would say. Um, yeah, but maybe I, I would like to intervene, maybe Rodchenko was a reformist in the sense um, Helmut is addressing it because uh, if you read his um, Tagebuch, sorry, diary. <laughs> diary, his diary, I mean he's quite, quite um, uh, really, really upset when he's uh, installing in Paris mm. and uh, bringing the camera back to Moscow for Vertov and smuggling it uh, through the borders. He's very upset how he's addressed. And when I read this, I really had the idea, I know this feeling very well, that you are just asked if you are expanding uh, fields or trying really to reform them. I would say this is also something which we did in this time. We tried to reform something. Um, then you are suddenly addressed as not, not the artist anymore, the first thing, and just like something like a designer. And this is what Rodchenko says. I mean, he says, you know, I lost this position. And I know it from so many uh, artist friends, I mean, being also uh, in the institutional critique um, uh, gallery, <laughs> so to say, that they say the same, that, you know, there's, there, there is kind of a danger, and I think this is also why you claim as artistic practice that we have to keep with this, because uh, it is also something which gets in danger, that you lose your position completely. Mm -hmm. and I think this is what Rochenko experienced as well. Yeah. Can, I, can I turn to the audience and ask for some questions? Do we have some microphones in the audience? There's one over there. Do you want do you want me to give this one? My, my name is uh, Victoria Preston. I have a, a question for either um, Helmut or, or Christian. I'm still not quite clear about the role of institutional critique with, within the former West project. So far, institutional critique has been defined as a Eurocentric concept. But there are, however, efforts to expand this. For example, the, the new anthology by Alberio and Stimston includes practitioners from Eastern Europe and Latin America. And at least one Asian museum has recently hosted an extensive discourse on institutional critique as part of an exercise in reinventing itself. Given our agreement about fluidity, entanglement, and the dissolution of the inside-outside, what critical purchase, if any, can institutional critique offer the former West project? Do we dismiss institutional critique as a historical project over after the second wave? If so, how do we explain the recent growth of interest in institutional critique? For example, the anthology, the debates in Transversal and Art Monthly, and conferences recently in London, Vienna, Warsaw, and Los Angeles. Or indeed, all the artists and curators who continue to practice what might be described as an evolving third wave. In the current discourse about systemic functionalism and categorical relationality, what kind of potentiality and to whom could institutional critique offer within the evolving former West project? Can I, can I take another two questions and I promise you we will come because it was wonderfully formulated and thank you very much. It's an example for everybody else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, do, you, do you want to come back? Can I, can I say something okay. immediately? Uh, because, uh, I mean, the part of the question addressed uh, 
towards the, the former West project quite generally, I think should, should, should really be asked uh, or, or should, should be put forward uh, to the organizers or I I initiators. And, and, and I, I, I very much uh, uh, took to heart, uh, like what, what you, Marion, said, uh, to finally start talking about oneself uh, and not always uh, about somebody else's projects or, or, or whatever. Uh, so so I, I'll only try to address, it, to address uh, this comment and actually uh, got a very big comment altogether for, from, a, from a more uh, personal perspective. I mean, uh, the way I was trying to, to outline the kind of, of problematic or, or symptomatic situation uh, attempts of institutional critique find themselves in or, or started to find themselves in like through, basically throughout the 90s and until today maybe uh, is that there is, well, put in a very simple way that it's no longer possible to maintain those bipolar oppositions that you're always already involved in that kind uh, of in entangled structures with institutions, which, which doesn't mean altogether that you have like to either totally uh, identify or that you have, I don't know, if, if you feel the need, why not do it, but, but totally distance yourself uh, from whatever institution uh, you're, you're, you're in touch with. But, um, uh, T telling you a little or, or just referring to, to the kind of uh, uh, process I've been also involved in and, and, and this could be maybe mapped out as a kind of, of parallel history uh, to, to what happened uh, to, to institutional critique or more, con more contemporary efforts uh, is with the, the magazine uh, I'm co-editing uh, uh, Springer in is that, that once uh, that, that structure or that kind of structural problem I was referring to became clearer and clearer and, and this was roughly about when, when also the magazine started uh, some 15 years ago, uh, a, a, a process of opening up uh, would, 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 would really start to, uh, to become effective and, 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 and uh, this, this really goes parallel I think uh, to finally recognizing that it's not a, a kind of bipolar, be it east-west or north-south or whatever, but it's really a, a multipolar world uh, that we're all uh, n not just dealing with, but we are all uh, inserted in, in, in probably uh, totally different ways, but, but, but nobody sort of, of can escape that reality. And uh, on the basis of, of being like a co-editor of a magazine, it, it became very, uh, kind of pertinent or important to really open up the field uh, and, 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 and not just, uh, I don't know, f focus on the kind of, of critical art tradition that the West has been uh, involved with uh, uh, in itself, but really, uh, I don't know, to, to I don't know, get, get a kind of bigger picture and, and really open up the space for, I don't know, vo voices com coming from Eastern European countries, uh, voices from whatever, South Africa, Latin voices America. From, from Latin America, Rabi Mouei was, was already mentioned, and, 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 a, and a lot of other people. But really to, to try to acknowledge uh, this multipolarity also uh, in, in a kind of, of editorial setup. So, so now I, 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 of course, haven't addressed the, the, the question that was put forward, how, how institutional critique uh, or, or a reformulation of it might figure within the former West, but, but that's probably not up to me to, to answer that. I mean, I, mean, I can I'm, be very brief. I'm not, I'm not sure whether we sanctify the term institutional critique at this moment, because I think we're still in the process of discovering what it means. But certainly the question of the institution in the period of the last 20 years in the West is undoubtedly a question, and whether that's the program and policy or funding. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I, to interrupt, I didn't want to interrupt you, I, but I have a simple, very simple suggestion. I'm, I, sorry, I'm simplifying, oversimplifying sometimes. But could it be that, I mean, to me, or to me, it appears like the institutional critique is a genuine conservative attitude. And what happens is that the institutions changed, and that's what the, the institutions we had are becoming former institutions, and the impulse of institutional critique was simply trying to keep the institutions as they were. So I would say that that's the, could be the relation to the former West, very simply. Thank you. <laughs>
No, I think, but certainly the, the research into the institutions, nevertheless, and that process is still something that's underway. So, mm. therefore, it remains a question in this whole trajectory, uh, which we're, we're speculating over the next three years until some sort of conclusion is reached in 2012. Can I add to it, just really quickly? We unfortunately missed the keynote, and that would probably become clear that we are trying to make two moves um, at once. We try to map out map out the histories of last 20 years and at the same time try to speculate uh, how to move from the, from the moment of now further. And I think institutional critiques such as relational aesthetics and other concepts are something that really need to be very seriously taken into consideration. And there is, um, however, another term that I think I, I came across <coughs> in one of Simon Schack's uh, writings where he compared the impact of institutional critique on art field and institution in comparison to so-called managerial critique, arguing that managerial critique um, uh, might have had much larger impact on uh, where we are now today. In other words, visitor numbers, budgets, um, uh, own income of institutions might have, have uh, had a much larger impact on where we are now with institution and even artistic practice than we are um, willing to admit. I would like to say something to that because these practices that uh, we did 20 years ago, <laughs> one could say, uh, came to an end actually very precisely with Schettaler. It came in a complete crisis when we found the rank in, uh, I think it was the Süddeutsche Zeitung, if I remember rightly, where the Schettaler was on the first rank having the lowest budget but the highest outcome on, on, uh, in, in the public. Yeah. And this was where I said, okay, I don't want to work there anymore and to kind of fulfill this kind of neoliberal dreams because, I mean, expanding the field, writing your own text because nobody else writes <laughs> about you. So in all these kind of practices that you in, in, in invent and suddenly you are in the rank of, uh, I think it was even Capital magazine. So um, I think this is uh, where uh, the whole projection came from and it's also the culturalization of economy which we didn't really talk about and I think that was a, such a strong topic in the message by OK and in all this kind of debates of the 90s and we foresee it but I think then in the after 2000 we really felt and I think till today we really see what are the effects of it. I think we were collecting questions from the audience, so let's uh, try to do that. My name is Jiminy Hignett, and I'm a student at the Dutch Art Institute in Enschede, and I feel totally out of my depth. Um, but I still have a, a comment, which unfortunately is not as succinctly worded as the question from uh, just now. Sorry about that. Um, it's just to express my surprise, in a way, that um, a topic which was brought up, in fact, yesterday by uh, Paul Gilroy, which is the war we are in, and the way it seems to have withdrawn, uh, as Jalal was, uh, was talking about, withdrawn from um, being present here. And I'm surprised about that and um, wonder if that could in any way relate to this, uh, if that's kind of symptomatic of this uh, issue of um, uh, a surpassing disaster. I know I'm not supposed to use people's terms, but uh, I don't know how to word it. Otherwise, so if the withdrawal of the war from this discussion is symptomatic of it being a, possibly being a surpassing disaster. Thank you. I have something to say, uh, which is, I haven't really thought through, but uh, I was inspired by David's impersonation of Althusser. Um, this idea of, you know, we have to read Marx again. Um, which is basically what he says. I mean, you, what you said basically repeated his introduction to reading Capital. Mm -hmm. uh, Marx hasn't been read in the West, in the East, anywhere. Uh, for the last 60 years, we have to read it again. Yeah. Um, the way that he reads Marx is, of course, really uh, controversial and in a way that perhaps can be, um, was accused of, of, say, of proposing a some kind of scientific reading that uh, dismissed any other type of reading. And, and, then, and then when, when uh, Marion and, and, 
and uh, Kirsten was we're talking about Rotchenko. So how can we re read Rotchenko? Um, do we have to read Rotchenko as Rotchenko read, him read himself? Or do we, can we read Marx as, can we actually pick up Rotchenko and make, it, make him figure in a history that may be interesting for us in the future? For sure. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's what I think that maybe all these discussions <laughs> are about. I mean, can we read uh, institutional critique in a way that may open up a new type of, of possibility for the future. Because at the end, I mean, what these histories are, I mean, it's, it's basically, I mean, completely relativist here, but constructed histories. I mean, the, of course, you, you have to go to the detail and see, compile as much information, but all this information has to be articulated in a narrative. And a narrative is always going to be, if we're talking here, I mean, uh, uh, maybe this is too romantic, but. Uh, Romantic as seen as legal and uh, this tradition, but uh, you, are, you can only construct these histories. I mean, Michelet is a real example of how you construct the history of the French Revolution. Uh, and I think that maybe that's what this project is one of the things it's doing. I guess that there's lots of dangers in doing that, but uh, um, that's, that's perhaps an interesting way to think about it. How can you read even relational aesthetics in a way that is emancipatory? I mean, that's a big challenge, perhaps, <laughs> but, but maybe it's possible. I don't know. Uh, may I say, just, I, I want to uh, also make my Marx quote, yeah, <laughs> and, uh, um, because of what you, you were referring to, what, what Boris Kroes was saying yesterday, and we had this whole emphasis on a very individual uh, remaking of one's own history, which I uh, don't share at all, yeah? and the Marx quote is, of course, that uh, men make their history, but they don't make it out of their free will. Yeah? Uh, and so, of course, uh, being able to, to, to make your history uh, is uh, under certain conditions. And I think if we have a, a, a little bit of a, of a moment with uh, a chance of, you know, re actualizing institutional critique, although I think it's a really highly problematic term, yeah? precisely because it comes out of this Rousseauan tradition within the left, which I, I consider to be highly problematic. Uh, but on the other hand, it developed its own history of practices yeah, and ideas in a certain way. And that's why I was also so happy with this uh, intervention by Paul Gilroy yesterday and referring, what are we doing here? You know, in most of the academic context, in political context, those questions are not right. Yeah? And I think there is a tradition in, in, in the art world in, in, in the meantime where this is uh, at least e at a certain point, yeah, it is possible to, to raise it. And, and I think it's really, uh, it's extremely important yeah, not to get stuck, you know, we are in a war, we can't say uh, now anything anymore uh, or whatever, but just to be aware that we are in a situation that we are not with, you know, innocent uh, uh, subjects and with uh, projective radicals, uh, etc. Et in a certain way, but that we have, you know, that we are in a, in a, in a consistent uh, struggle and that this is a struggle going on more or less every day and it is also a struggle about our histories, our own histories. And of course I'm promoting my own history. Why not, yeah. um. Can I add something to that? Because, because there was so much talk about interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, and I forgot the other disciplinarity. Extra. Extra. Thanks. <laughs> um, I'm very much against disciplinarities. Um, and I think like exactly this, this idea of how to recover history when you're yourself bound into history, if this is not just, if this should not be just another appropriation by another discipline, then um, disciplines have to be rethought in the ways of, sorry, very orthodoxly, um, division of labor mm -hmm. in like how do those administrative functions come about. And this is also, I mean, yesterday there was the talk about anti-politics, which I know more from like a Marxist mm -hmm. tradition from somebody like Johannes Agnoli, who was saying anti-politics, not to refrain from politics, but to say politics in the hegemonial sense are just administration and we have to close down the field of administration to do politics. So I would say this is very, like an important task within historiography. Um, I just let, oh, Charles Murray with that, uh, art historian, curator. Um, just like to uh, make, uh, bring, bring to the table an example which I think raises the stakes in terms of the um, issue about institutional critique. Um, it has to do with, in part with Abu Dhabi, but uh, it has more, uh, better defined would be, has to do with, with uh, the Islamic world and uh, with the West um, and the 
uh, agreement that's been developed now uh, and much publicized between uh, Abu Dhabi government uh, and the French uh, government in terms of the Louvre Abu Dhabi, development of the Louvre Abu Dhabi, uh, and with the Guggenheim, and uh, with the Guggenheim franchise. Uh, I worked there for a year uh, as a deputy director for the cultural district on Sadiat Island. So I was very involved in the contractual agreements um, and the development of those. And uh, why I raise it in the context of the institutional critique is that it seems to me that the institutions, in a sense, uh, have uh, sidestepped uh, the kinds of challenges provided from uh, both, in a sense, within and without, as they were addressed by the two papers. Uh, and on the one hand, of course, the Guggenheim in terms of uh, kind of an alignment of a managerial class, of an international or global managerial class. And Tom Krenz was clear enough in saying that he, in a sense, was interested in Guggenheim, um, as we know, um, as a brand. Um, and that uh, it was very much about, about extending this uh, franchise uh, to be able to provide uh, finance for, for the source. Of course, he's been cut off from the source now. So it's a more complicated story, but to put it in parallel with the Louvre, uh, with the, Louvre uh, the, the Louvre project uh, moved from being uh, one concerned with uh, the classical uh, to the universal. Um, and what it systematically uh, set out to establish was what it called a sort of 21st century uh, universalism. And uh, this seems to me to be uh, a tremendous challenge for a number of ways, be partly because um, they're starting to establish a consortium of museums uh, through which to construct what they um, call a universal history. Um, and uh, they're not interested at all um, in any kind of uh, critique. In fact, their, their way forward, which is why I put it in parallel with, with Krenz uh, and the Guggenheim, is in fact to sidestep the critique by embracing it and saying that the critique is within their larger vision of either the global uh, or the universal. Uh, I mean, there's a lot more to say about this specifically in terms of, for example, the universal going back to uh, the Napoleonic era and the history of, and the role of the Louvre and, of course, of the French government establishing nuclear interests uh, in the Persian Gulf. But I just wanted to introduce that as being a further challenge, I think, to the institutional critique. No, thank you very much for this uh, statement in a certain way. And indeed, it's, that's what I uh, missed uh, in my, my answer to your first question. Because of course, with the globalization of, uh, of the museums taking place, at least since the, the 1980s, with Thomas Krenz as a well, forerunner, uh, is one of uh, the, the biggest changes, yeah, and uh, inscribing the whole the, the, uh, the, the museum landscape into this new territory of global elites, uh, which make the nation state and the, you know traditional uh, conflicts uh, uh, so much more difficult in a certain way. So that uh, the positions of uh, sameness and others are uh, split it and on, on many layers so that it's really difficult to behave. I mean, some of, of us here, I think, are involved in, in projects what uh, uh, Andreas Siegmann and Alice Kreischer are promoting in a moment where, where the museum projects in Dubai are a big uh, uh, issue and uh, there was just in Berlin we had an opera <laughs> uh, around this subject. So uh, there is this uh, closely connected to the, to the rebuilding of a castle and uh, having the idea of a, of a uh, new you know, uh, central museum where the Humboldt Forum um, on right on the space of, you know, uh, of uh, 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 imperial power in, in a certain way. Uh, so those are, uh, of course, in a, in a very interesting sense, I think, uh, uh, moments where the, where, the, where the big institution changed and uh, where we have very little, um, uh, more or less, um, uh, uh, means yeah, in, in dealing with. Maybe those are, you know, those would be examples of, 
of a new way of, of institutional critique. In this way, was way, this opera took place as a fake uh, press conference, yeah? uh, where they had actors and they were playing the, the museum directors of three big uh, German museums in Munich, Dresden, and Berlin. And they are actually you know, collaborating now with, uh, with Dubai and building up this museum. Uh, you know, like they want to compete with the Louvre and, and things like that, and also the Germans have to go there, etc. And of course, that is one story, but you could also think of what Kohlhaas is doing in, in China, in Peking, etc. And there things look a little bit different because how, how those projects are sold, they are completely sold through uh, or marketed through, through critique, yeah? through criticality. Yeah? Uh, we are helping the Chinese people, you know, to, to uh, perform uh, bourgeois publicity in a certain way, and uh, so we are the real, uh, the, the real critics, yeah? not those uh, in the autonomous territories of art world or whatever, uh, just uh, talking, but we are really delivering critique yeah? in, into the center of, you know, the, the last uh, remaining uh, big communist uh, territory and things like that. And so I think here the tensions are... I, I, uh, um, yeah, I have only a, a very brief remark to, to add to that. Uh, I mean, this, of course, this, this, these are the, the legitimate sides of, of call it a, a contemporary institutional critique, but the question is also what, what would nowadays be uh, the proper forum uh, to, to get that critique across somehow, or, or to, to get it to the uh, uh, to the, to the actual, actual uh, de decision makers, how, how do you get uh, that message out to, to somebody in Abu Dhabi, or maybe even to the to the authorities uh, at the Louvre? Uh, it's, it's definitely not, not coming from from this circle we we are in right now, and and if the opera in Berlin. Uh, uh, st stages that whole thing. Uh, that, that's great, but but uh, a question still has to remain: uh, how to get those those wider repercussions uh, going? Uh, I would also make a remark. I mean, it's true. I mean, there is an expansion. There is kind of also a neo-colonial move. But what I already said yesterday. I mean, uh, in the invention of the uh, knowledge economy. Uh, there's still the possibility to intervene. And when the question, I mean, what really changed maybe in the art, I can say something's changed in the art education and the art education system, I think, uh, in general, has, you know, also integrated the institutional critique. We are all now in institutions and teaching critique somehow, very kind of paradoxical situation. Um, and uh, so we are affected from another side. I mean, this is how we make our living. Actually, I would like to make my living a differently, I have to say, than I mean, integrated in a state uh, institution. I mean, to say it honestly. But uh, on the other hand, there's also an impact, and I have to say that some of these practices we were talking about from the 90s are not just only have pessimistic ends. We are since three weeks in strike in the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, and okay. now it is, uh, yes, and it is, it is students and also the teachers are behind. It's because we are very well informed in the neoliberal shift, because, I mean, we can, I mean, the, the, the students stand in front of the camera and they say, really, I mean, very precise uh, anti-capitalist things. And, and, and I think there is a change. I think this is a reformist perspective. There is a possibility of change. And now the whole country is quartered. I mean, there are more than 50,000 people on the street and demonstrating against this new liberal university. I think this is also, uh, it's not only pessimistic. <laughs> Stephen, would you have a comment? Of course. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to spoil the party, but uh, it's, it's, uh, that's the most obvious thing that you end up in the institutions as your critique is basically an affirmation of these institutions. Uh, that's, that's the most natural development one can have. And also the problem that I have with the students, what do they want to do? They, 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 mask, they, they mask their protest as criticality, but actually what they want is to keep the institutions they're in as no. they are. No, and, no. and the, 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 actually, I think the... the, the Come the, to Vienna. <laughs> what, 
the it's challenges to the education yeah. the, the challenges to the education system are enormous mm -hmm. but we're not we're not tackling them by by so to say, by, by by ignoring what are the challenges and they come from somewhere else definitely they, they the, the the whole no, from the from the they come from the sphere of digital knowledge production and of knowledge circulation and i'm 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 okay there is edu factory and there are some initiatives that are, that, that, that go quite well along that way, but I'm, I'm skeptical about these, these protests. Okay, I, 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 I'm, I'm not 100% aware of that. I'm flying to Austria tomorrow and I, I try to make, my, to, to make myself an image there. <laughs> who is paying that, actually? <laughs> <laughs> he was pay, who is paying me? Guess what? The private university which has, which has since quite a while uh, reformed itself to the M, to MA and BA system, and I'm going to teach there. I'm sorry. I'm, I also so have okay. my institution. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about guilt. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hello, uh, I'm Matteo Lucchetti. I have a question for everyone. I think uh, that uh, in this uh, changing of the art institution that we are talking about, and uh, that has also been put together with these managerial uh, uh, aspects, let's say, I, I can see a sort of Foucaultian governance of the art system that is uh, clearly coming out in some way. <clears throat> and I think that also it has to deal with uh, uh, a thing that came out before in the uh, Christian Ola um, uh, speaking, when he was saying about a, a kind of a disciplina disciplinating um, way no, of uh, uh, discipl disciplinating uh, attitude. And I think that this, this governance of their system that is clearly in some part or at least in some situation coming out has to deal also with uh, this, uh, 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 let's say, intensification of uh, power in, in, the, in, the, in the structures of the art system through this governance. And so it, it creates a sort of, uh, more than a disciplination, a kind of uh, self-disciplinating uh, 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 behavior in, in a lot of uh, new generation of artists and curators and also in this, uh, uh, let's say, movement towards a prof prof professionalization of the curating uh, work. I don't know. It was just a question. Actually, coming back uh, to, to what you just said about uh, the Austrian student protests, uh, uh, and, and this might be uh, not a close parallel, but, but it just came to my mind. Uh, uh, nobody expected it in a way, or, or everybody was under the impression that like the, the current academic system uh, would, would only have those disciplining, disciplinary uh, effects for an indefinite future <laughs> because protest was something really of the past or, or maybe of the 60s and it resurfaced a little in, in the 80s. But af after that, it, it, it was suddenly gone. And, and, and then all, all, all of a sudden, this uh, uh, so, sort of very undisciplined, uh, Although they are, they are I think, behaving in, in, in quite disciplinary ways in, in another respect uh, altogether, but 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 suddenly uh, uh, out of this very kind of streamlined, very smoothly functioning, in, in a way superficially smoothly functioning institution, so something exploded uh, out of it, and and I, I'm only wondering if if if, if so, not something like this. Uh, could, could happen to, to the art system in, at some point in the future. M maybe I'm, I'm over-optimistic now and I'm also putting this as a question, but uh, I mean for, for, for the universities, uh, I think if you, if you worked inside or if you were close enough to that scene, you, you saw it coming in a way, but, but you probably didn't see it coming uh, in, in the way that it actually did or, or that, it, that it erupted or, or got uh, out together because it, it, it's still organized in a, in a very basic, uh, uh, basic democratic way and, and I think they don't, want, don't even want to appoint representatives so, so it's always a, 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 a changing uh, pattern of, of, of who is allowed to speak or make any remarks but there are no, no, no representatives for it. Uh, but I don't know, who knows? I was also thinking we should remember that um, in Croatia there were quite some considerable protests recently and also in California there's still an occupation going on so there are some moments and I think there is a genuine 
danger that these are sort of conservative uh, movements in which there's, a, there's an idea of preservation uh, of, of existing structures, of funding existing structures. I think, I think it's worthwhile taking, it on, t taking that critique on board. But I, do, I would ask whether, whether there is not some possibility in these actions which might emerge in the process. You know, it might emerge in the process of struggle, and this is very primitive Marxism, but, but, uh, but, but things will emerge in that process of struggle which cannot be accounted for in the way that, that you're accounting for everything in this. I, I suppose my, my worry about your critique is that it is an account of everything. It is an account of everything because it talks about a change in time, which is something which is, which is uncontrollable by us and we have no agency over it seems. And, and, and that change in time is being dictated to us by a technology and a communication system, which is again an imposition on us, as the state was, as religion was previously in those, in those controls of time. And it worries <coughs> me that the, 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 the sort of counsel of, the hopelessness, of hopelessness that you're offering is I'm not sure really met by reality. You know, I mean, I, 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 would, I would be happy if it, if it were like you say, and I think that there is, there is quite a lot of chances. But the, we have an, another, so to say, symptom of the same, of the same thing we witnessed today here. It, we, that is the reading Marx. I'm sorry, that is something almost, that is a kind of religious complex. That if, if we were in a religious community, the people would say we should read the Koran or we should read the Bible. And it comes, the argument comes very much in the same line. I was not surprised at all to find that the Marxists were not aware of the crisis coming. None of them. There was no debate of what, of what happened in the financial world. Now, afterwards, they, afterwards they, they, they have to find, <laughs> to find it out. Hmm? And so, that, so the, 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 the most, the, 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 the most, what no, did you read? The, 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 the most, the most, the most valid critique of what happened, you, you did not, of what was about to happen, you did not find in the Marxist debate, but you find by Hyman Minsky, which is a Keynesian, a Keynesian economist. I think reading, I have nothing against reading Marx, but I think it, 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 there's some things that Marx completely missed, couldn't, that he couldn't have got. For example, the idea of, of the kind of money and of the kind of reflexive money that we have, he only had to a certain degree. And if you get stuck in reading Marx, we are, we are actually at the, in the very same kind of conservative, conservative complex. We might read Marx, but we have to step beyond Marx and beyond Marxism. And God, but what we, is God, your problem God, with God, conservatism? But, but, but God, I, I mean, and God, uh, and, explain <laughs> yourself a little. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, sorry. Sorry. That, that's where I really have a problem because the world is changing, and we, if if if, huh, and it, it puts the challenge to, to not okay. We have to, we have to follow that change. We have to we have to devise model for that change. If we do not if we do not come up with new models how how to tackle that change, we're actually running in, in, in actually we're running into that trap. And I doubt very much that the institution and critique or Marxism, the, the both things that we discussed, will be able to bring out these models. David, you've been reading Marx. Mm. <laughs> I don't want to, I mean, you know, now if I in, uh, religiously insist, I'll be confirming Resurrect. what you say. So you yeah, have to kind of deny, I didn't say what I said. I withdraw. I, have the I don't new know. I, I think. I think. Uh, I have the New Testament for you. This is Gibson Graham. Thank you. Yeah. No. I. I mean. But what, But I mean. Maybe. Maybe the question is. Is given that you've been reading Marx, and yeah. we're not going to talk about why. But what has that? <laughs> what uh, in in the sense that what what has reading this? Because the question you asked is okay. It's fine to read Marx, but what does it lead to in your thinking today? What does it renew in possible thinking? And I think that would be the question to you: is that what is it? What has it allowed you to think that you couldn't think otherwise? It's you know it's it's a really it's a complicated encounter. So I have I would have to it would be a whole lecture in and of itself, yeah? Um, just, just brief, you know, briefly, um, there are th things that, you know, are classically sort of where you say, Marx didn't know about this, Marx didn't know about this, Marx didn't have this. One of the things that, that struck me actually at, in a, in a, at, a, at a very early point was I was reading um, the Holy Family, so now you can immediately <laughs> do the, do the, the religious uh, well, critique. Really, I was reading yeah. The Holy Family, yeah. and um, there's this great, you know, I'm, I, was, I, I worked as a translator for 15 years, you know? and it's one of the most brilliant critiques of translation, and one of the most brilliant conceptualizations of what a translation actually does, that I couldn't find in the volumes of translation theory that I'd read before then. 
for an example. This is just one of many examples where I see a relevance beyond the kind of narrow frame of the 19th century, where you have things that are very, very, very current today and current to my practice as, as a cultural producer, you know, um, where I see that there's a, there's a, there are some real answers on to how, how to go about, for an example, an ideological critique of translation as something that inevitably distorts. Yeah? And as, some, as someone who was constantly translating text from a Russian context, for an example, yeah? um, I really needed this. Yeah? So it wasn't like a, a religious uh, frame of reference that would suddenly help me to, to you know, finally believe in the advent of communism or something like this, yeah? the second coming. This was not it at all. Even though I have to say that, you know, um, obviously, yeah, this, this, is, this is something that, but this is something that you don't believe in. This is something that either happens or doesn't happen and you're an agency in that or not, you know. Um, I mean, I don't, I, I wouldn't, uh, also I wouldn't be so, I wouldn't prescribe anything to anyone, but I, I would make an argument for that the, these texts uh, have something to say. By the way, not only Marx, but other 19th century thinkers who would very discredit, discredited in a facile way too. Um, you know, where, for an example, I think you can find in, the phenom uh, in, in Hegel's phenomenology uh, very interesting things that apply to immaterial labor, for an example. Yeah, where you would, for, if you take um, what he says about the, the, the chapter about Bildung, about education, yeah? and the, the function that uh, Diderot's, uh, Rameau's nephew has here, which is a really, that's a really big topic. I mean, it's a lecture for two hours, so I stop we, here. We really have that. Yeah, we have I'll a question <coughs> um, I don't know if, well, I'll try and phrase it as a question. It's probably more a comment because the microphone was pointed my way, probably as someone who has worked both with with uh, Marxism and institutional critique. Um, I would just say that I don't have a problem with reading Marx, and I would actually say that when we read it now, we would not be able to read it the same way that one would read the Bible. This would not be possible, because it's not a, a tradition. It's maybe something else like a legacy. And I, uh, although I do agree with, with Stefan that there are developments in the later stages of capital that are not predicted by Marxist capital, and maybe in, in terms of a legacy, this is what we as theorists uh, have to develop, is that kind of critique of uh, reflexive capital, for instance. Uh, and, and, and this is now where I'll try and make it into a question, is that if, can we think of something as legacy uh, in the way that when we are fighting for certain rights that have been perhaps won through a previous historical political struggle that to try and keep these rights may not be conservatism because I do have a problem with conservatism but, but that maybe we have to see these struggles as continuous especially in the light of what uh, also Paul G. Roy talked about yesterday about all the infringements on our civil rights and to fight for having, getting them back may not mean conservatism. It may mean that we are in continuous struggle and just because certain rights were won, it does not mean that they are obsolete. Rather, we know, I think, from the last 20 years or even longer from the 80s, from basically from Reaganism and Thatcherism, that rights can be taken away and we have to fight to keep them. So it's a continuous struggle. So therefore, I would suggest somehow this notion of legacy. Could I add to that the notion of historical imagination? Because the, uh, I don't wish to say obsession with institutional critique, but it's been as though all institutions and museums are just involved in um, an exercise of the contemporary in some way. And, um, and I'm just talking about the, the, when you talked about repositioning one's assessment of Rodchenko or something, and your beautiful exhibition of Elisitsky, Charles. I'm just trying to say that the imperative to empower future generations to be able to read that kind of thing really does require um, the enabling of people to have an imagination that goes beyond the immediate political problems of the contemporary by looking back at the past with enough breadth and possibility of imagination to reinvest those moments or those art objects with the discourses that in initially inspired them or their intentions. And I think that the project of former West should take on board, I mean, even Lenin 
uh, you know, didn't want to kind of scrap the complete cultural heritage of the previous former West. I do think that there is a question of, um, uh, which is not to do with conservatism, of not only heritage and responsibility, but the empowerment for the future of a historical imagination. That's all I wanted to say. Can I say something about the, the rights thing which Simon just brought up? Because um, um, I would actually say it's reactionary and really like in a literal sense to, to fight for keeping rights which were um, about punishing and disciplining in the first place. I mean, I don't want to like I don't want to look back at Fordism and go like, oh, it was so nice when we were all still disciplined into being this, this and that. Um, it's not a, it, I don't think it's a positive alternative and, and do, I mean just like to, like in a very abstract way, there is, um, there is this argument about what is mentioned, human rights, um, I mean there is, has been big discussions about human rights and like what is the problem of human rights and most of the times like the, the term in itself is affirmed. But I mean, human rights in themselves are a very good example of the problem because if there were human rights, there will, would be no need for the existence of human rights, which are inscribed by states and by nations, and the sheer existence of them is a problem of freedom and a lack of emancipation. But where should we be, you know, installed? In which kind of institution? When we should be before their institutionalization? Where should we come from? I mean, it's a historical process mm. we are in. So we can't, I think we are, of course, highly ambivalent, yeah? but there is no way, you know, uh, more or less not to refer to them, yeah? um, although they are so ideological. Mm. I think that's the point. Yeah? I think and this is, where, where I think, a really difficult point to grasp. Yeah? Um, Absolutely, but I wouldn't say not to refer to them, but I would rather say, like, the problem is if you, if you demand rights, you always demand rights from a state, and I refuse to do radical leftist politics and demanding something from the state because this yeah, is not the, mm -hmm. not the agency I'm mm -hmm. applying mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. But I mean, human rights are not I mean, inscribed in the state. No, not in singular ones. No. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, one has to also be careful but because in relation to this kind of concept, I agree on this kind of perspective, I mean on a radical perspective, but then again I would be a reformist because I know that the, in the shadow of the human rights this is the only possibility that you can come and travel under the visa line. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is a space also where you can, we as activists, have the possibility to fight against the border and the migration regime. This is the only reason why they don't put us in jail. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think it's, it's a tricky question. Sure. Do we take one more question? Is there one more urgent question in the audience somewhere? On this side? No? I mean, Maybe I should clarify my conservatism, but we oh. <laughs> do it later. We can do it tomorrow, we Maybe I have a, because of the comments, because I'm also quite interested in this um, concept, but maybe from a, a different perspective, as um, we are living in a cognitive capitalism, which kind of is a, has a parasitic uh, relation to our life, also to our sociality. You know, um, um, there is a concept of fucked up commons in terms of, of course, fucked up commons. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that we are always able to create commons, you know, like this situation that we communicate with each mm -hmm. other and that we don't you know, shoot each other. <laughs> well, that there's kind of a common agreement that we sit here and share these commons. <laughs> Um, so, but the problem is that because it's also very symbolic and it's about cultural capital that we are gaining, somehow it's fucked up. <laughs> yeah, so we are always in a situation of fucked up commons and I think we are more and more in a situation of fucked up commons because we, uh, the, uh, the symbolic and the uh, cultural capital gets much more value than the monetary value. Um, yeah, interesting. <laughs> but, um, I have to... Um, um, I can say something about this, but then uh, um, I will uh, go back to part of my um, mm -hmm. presentation. 
which was uh, maybe not uh, completely clear as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's uh, about the, the public and the, the new amateur as uh, being the former public. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I also hope that the public will become a topic within the research of uh, Forum West. But um, yeah, what I would like to um, uh, emphasize is that the constitution of the public is being changed. Eh? Um, so it's said that uh, the, the public is um, uh, participating and therefore it's, uh, um, um, it's um, em emancipating. Eh? Um, but uh, you could also consider it... Um, uh, as the public being uh, disciplinized and um, being made or transformed into a material um, that can be consumed and can consume and that can produce on its own uh, that's what can be consumed mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, yeah of, and it is uh, it's producing immaterial uh, goods like you mm -hmm. eh? um, so yeah maybe that has it is not directly in uh, uh, an answer to your statement, or but it has. No, it's, it's you understand. an explanation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Shall we close it there? Can I take this opportunity to thank everybody in this room and to uh, say how much I look forward to see all of you tomorrow at 10 o'clock? We again have a remarkable lineup um, of speakers to engage in a conversation with us and that's exciting. I wish you a nice evening and see you tomorrow. Thank you again. Thank you.